Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the government and legal correspondent. And uh, it is an election year and we have another uh, candidate for office today. Our guest is Philip Anderson, who is running for governor. And uh, welcome to the show, Mr. Anderson. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. And uh, we should start off the fact that you are running as a libertarian. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Before I ask you why libertarian, why don't you give folks a little bit about yourself? Um, okay. Uh, your family I've been in, in Wisconsin job. pretty much my, my entire life. I was born and raised in Beloit, uh, left Beloit in 1985 to join the U.S. Army. I was a combat medic in a Patriot Missile Battalion for three years. And then I got out to attend school at UW-Madison and never left. I got my degree in geography, um, met my wife, uh, got involved in the taxi business here, ended up managing a couple of taxi companies, um, have two kids, 20 and 17. My, my oldest, uh, my daughter, is a student at UW-Madison. My son attends high school, and I'm currently a real estate broker. That's what I do. <laughs> All right. So a uh, small business owner and... Uh, being in real estate and everything, so that exposed you to different areas of uh, uh, regulation and so forth. Why the Libertarian Party? Well, I started following, well, I've been following politics my entire life, but mainly after about 2008, I realized that people like Ron Paul uh, weren't getting much respect or a fair shake in terms of the process of uh, elections and how the media covered elections. And I thought that was really unfair because what resonated uh, from his message to me was the idea that government should be limited, as it states in the Constitution, and that, that rights belong with people. And that, um, that message, that idea and philosophy, hasn't really been expressed or practiced by Democrats or Republicans in a long time. So when in about 2012 or 13, after my kids hearing me complain about the political system for, for years and years, they said, Dad, why don't you do something about it? I decided to do so, and it made sense for me that the Libertarian Party would be my political home. Okay. So you joined the party, and uh, I understand now you are the chair of the state party. Is that correct? I am the chair of the state party. I was elected uh, at last year's convention in 2017. My term will be up this May in 2019. I also serve on the Libertarian National Committee as well. Okay. And so, but this is not your first time uh, for running for political office. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? No, my first uh, attempt was in 2014. I ran for Wisconsin State Assembly District 47, which is uh, Fitchburg, the town of Madison, McFarland, and Monona, pretty much. A very, very blue Democrat district. An incumbent was running at the time, Rob Call. Um, there was not a Republican running. That's, how, that's actually how Democrat the district is. And I got about 19% of the vote, which I thought was pretty good for a first time through. And then in 2016, I decided to run for United States Senate. I've uh, got almost 90,000 votes, about 3%. Okay. And uh, let our viewers know, what's the significance of getting over 1% for a statewide office for the Libertarian Party? Well, for, for any party, but it's especially uh, significant for us or any other smaller party, um, every, every candidate in all the parties has to get signatures to be on the ballot. That includes governor candidates, Senate candidates, congressional candidates, um, all the way down to state assembly. But if your party has one statewide candidate who gets more than 1% in an election cycle, then that party's presidential nominee will be automatically on the ballot for the next one. So in this case, in 2018, um, you, I expect to get much more than 1% based, based on history and how, how well we're polling now. But assuming I get more than 1%, then automatically our Libertarian nominee, whoever that is, will be on the ballot in Wisconsin in 2020 automatically. Well, well but the Libertarians have not necessarily um, had that in every race. Um, so, uh, I, But they've had a high point in 2002 with getting over 10% when Ed Thompson ran for governor, correct? That, that's right. That was, a, that was a particular case. Ed was pretty famous already. A very good libertarian, but by virtue of being Tommy Thompson's brother, he had a little bit of an advantage. I wish I had that advantage. I don't want to be Scott Walker's brother, but I'm just saying that that was a little bit of an outlier in terms of how we've done across the years. But uh, that's history, and uh, this right. is a totally different landscape, and uh, things have evolved over the last couple of decades where it is very partisan, and it's either red or blue. Uh, there is no other colors and no other uh, seems to be points of view, but... Um, what is uh, your message now running for governor? And then, and also why governor? You could take either one of those first. 
Well, I decided to run for governor because uh, I suspected, and it turned out to be true, that between Scott Walker and whoever the Democrats nominated, there wouldn't be anyone standing for individuals in small communities. Um, Scott Walker obviously is supposed to be a conservative, but he does a lot of things that exert state control and exert uh, control over smaller communities and over individuals' rights at the behest of his party and the federal government. Tony Evers is also a big government politician. He does, doesn't deny it. He wants to raise taxes and increase control over school districts and things like that. And I really felt it was important that 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 some candidate, in this case me, represented the idea that people have rights and that the decisions that are made at the local level, the neighborhood level, the city council, county board level are much more transparent, much more accountable um, and much more likely to succeed because the people that involved they're involved in implementing those those things are are involved in the decision making. That's not the situation that we have now. So choosing governor was important. Also, as the chair of the state party, it made sense for me to lead uh, all of our candidates. We have six uh, state assembly candidates as well as a lieutenant governor candidate. So it was important to to be able to lead that that group of people uh, through the election process because most of them haven't run for office before. Okay. So you have uh, libertarians all across the ticket, not just uh, you running for governor. And um, Correct. Yep. All right. So what is uh, your message in this gubernatorial race? Are you more reactionary to what the issues are being shaped by Walker and Evers, or are you out there championing some issues they're not even mentioning? Well, a little bit of both. Um, we have three main themes to our campaign. Number one is getting rid of the state income tax. Now, the state income tax is basically a blank check that goes to Madison uh, when you pay your taxes, and they're free to spend that however they choose. And that's the money that fuels crony capitalism, it fuels the WEDC, which gives us Foxconn. Um, all of the things that we don't like about government are generally funded by the state income tax. The things that government provides that we agree that we do need, roads are 91% supported by uh, the gas tax. Schools are generally supported by property taxes. Uh, you know, taxes that at least have accountability and transparency and have a, have a direction to them, we don't object to at this time, but the state income tax needs to go. Second of all, uh, we, we are going to fight for more local control. When elected, I'm going to look at every aspect of the state government, and I've already looked at most of them already, and decide if that has to happen at the state level or if it can happen at the, at the more local level. That it goes with taxation, road building, education, health care, whatever it might be. Those things that can be pushed to a more local level uh, should be, because again, that, as I stated in the previous answer, uh, that's where there's more accountability and more transparency. We don't really know what's going on inside the state capitol building. There's all kinds of deal making going on, all kinds of things that, that we're not aware of, and it shouldn't be that way. So we're fighting for more local control. And last of all, uh, we believe that Wisconsin's economic climate is best when there's a low level of taxation and a lower level of regulation. There's no need to pick winners and losers, as the Walker administration has done with the WEDC and Foxconn, among others, and that uh, Jim Doyle uh, did with the Commerce Department, and Tony Evers will certainly do if he's elected. We believe, and, and it's borne out by examples in other states and other countries, that if you just have a lower level of taxation and regulation and have some certainty to that, meaning that it's clear that, that politicians can't be bought and paid for in order to manipulate the, econo the economy of a state, that, that uh, businesses will relocate here, and the companies that are here won't be paying more taxes so that other companies can come here and compete for resources and labor. It's not fair at all that we're, we're shelling out in one way, shape, or form almost $5 billion for Foxconn to come here when that's – then they're receiving the benefits of that plus other exceptions to – uh, land use laws and and uh, legal process involving the, the state Supreme Court when other companies have to foot that bill and then compete with that. That doesn't make any sense. I prefer to side with the people that are already here in Wisconsin, small employers, business owners, families making decisions about how to spend their money and not the government deciding who should win and who should lose. So those three things, basically. Well, um, it sounds like you have then criticisms of both candidates and both parties uh, let's start. You've mentioned the Foxconn, and uh, that's one distinction between, I guess, Evers and and Walker. So where do you come down on that? Well, I'm totally against it for a number of reasons. First of all, the idea that government should be taxing and then giving that money away to companies to come work to come uh, work here doesn't make any economic sense at all because the same economic growth would occur if we're leaving that money in the pockets of small business owners, employers, and families. But also this company in particular. 
it's in the tech industry, which changes rapidly. The, the horizon for this money being paid back to the state government in the form of taxation that's projected and assuming that they hire the number of workers they, they're expecting to is 25 years. And there's no guarantee, especially in the tech industry, that they'll even be a viable company. They also have a bad record of behaving with, uh, with governments that they made these deals with um, and with employees. As a matter of fact, they've got facilities in Southeast Asia where they have to have suicide nets around them because employees are prone to jump out the window. These are these are all many, many reasons why this deal never should have happened. And if I'm ele elected governor, I'm going to renegotiate that deal. Um, it, it's it's a travesty, uh, not only economically and in terms of the sort of government it is, and that is picking winners and losers uh, based on political means or political decisions. But also that company in particular is a bad one to do business with. And uh, you mentioned earlier before that uh, almost five billion now. I had heard originally it was supposed to be three billion, and now I've heard it's crept up. Do you uh, do you understand where it's at now and what the latest yes, is on that? Yes, that's, that's an important point because in the rhetoric of this, uh, there's this back and forth between people that support it and people that are against it. And the truth of it is, based in right in the contract, is that about a billion and a half of that is construction credits that they get just by building the plant. So before they hire anybody except for local contractors, if they assume that they hire local contractors to do the construction, that money goes to them. Another one and a half billion or so is indexed based on how many people they hire, which that assumes that they're going to hire up to 13,000 people and that over the 25 year history of this of this project and how it looks, that they'll be able to pay that back in, in taxes in one way, shape or form. But there's also the local tax burden uh, in Racine County and the local municipalities that they've had to offer tax breaks as well, up to a billion and a half included in that. And those aren't tax rebates or refunds. That's money that is going to come right out of the taxpayers of those counties, either directly taxed or borrowed you know, on their children's behalf to pay for that sort of thing. And that's on top of the fact, and this isn't really counted in it, but uh, it should be, that the local governments on behalf of Foxconn are, are using eminent domain to kick people out of their homes and off their farms to build this facility. And while that doesn't really have a dollar amount in terms of what the government's doing to help Foxconn, it should. And it's wrecking families and, and lives. And uh, that's well documented if you just follow the news about it. And that, sh that shouldn't happen. I mean, that really, really shouldn't happen. That's immoral as well as being bad government. So we kind of we understand where you stand on Foxconn. And um, I take it that you would like to see, uh, um, first of all, you don't like the concept of tax shifting, I mean, or, or collecting taxes correct. and then directing where it goes. You prefer exactly. just not to have the tax in the first place, correct? Right. It's, it's all what people lose track of. The politicians play on the fact that people lose track of the idea that government doesn't have its own money, that that money comes either out of our pockets or it's borrowed, which means our children will be paying it back. Um, the idea that government can, can pick these winners and losers, even if they were fair and arbitrary about it, would be problematic. But both Democrats and Republicans have shown that they play uh, they play favorites with that. And uh, the Obama administration was famous with Solyndra and other companies that they gave they gave grants to that ended up just disappearing. Um, and even setting aside Foxconn, there was a deal that the state made with Port Edwards to to, uh, to uh, rehabilitate a mill up there or something. And there's a ten million dollar grant through the WEDC, and that company is now in Ohio with with our taxpayer money. So. <laughs> I mean, if you just if you follow along a little bit, you can see that it's a bad idea to do this sort of thing. Uh, even if it's done well, it's bad. But our state government does a very bad job of it. Well, you've given us your three major themes. Now I want to see how they fit maybe with the way that the other two candidates or the primary two candidates, if you will, um, are spinning um, the, sure. the, the, the big uh, issues. Let's start with education. They're fighting against each other. Who's going to be more of the education governor? And... What would be your take on that? And um, I'll, I'll have a follow up regarding private school vouchers. All right. Excellent. Well, we just put out our, our education plan a couple of weeks ago. It is basically this universal open enrollment. The idea that the government should be able to decide how you educate your kids or where you should educate them is is ridiculous. Parents have that right. Parents pay for that. That's another thing that's lost, as I mentioned before. Everybody pays property taxes. Even people that rent are paying that through their rent. So our plan is to give that freedom as to how to educate your children, how, where, and, and how, you know, the, the curriculum back to parents and give their taxes back to them. Now, every school district has a number that it uses for open enrollment, and that's why we borrow the term. 
Uh, it's a dollar amount, $1,800, $2,000, $2,500, whatever it is from district to district, that if that child open enrolls to another district, the dollars follow them. My proposal, and what I'll try to fight for if elected, is that that money should go with the parents and they should be able to use that not just in another public school district or a private school district, but however they want to use that. That still leaves plenty of funds in the, in the public school system to educate the kids that are there because we're not taking out all of the tax money and there's a lot of people that pay taxes that don't have kids in school as well. So it's not pulling out the supports from public schools, but it's giving parents the right to choose what education is best for them, allowing uh, parents in poorer school districts, for example, Milwaukee, to opt out of the public schools and to have some funds to use somewhere else. Um, How does that compare to where the way that Scott Walker has increased or expanded private school vouchers using uh, public taxpayer dollars? And That's an excellent question. Right now, Scott Walker is supporting the Common Core standards from the federal government because any voucher has to be a school in order for a school to accept vouchers through this program they have to adhere to common core standards and so what's happening is even worse than tony evers making sure that that exists in public schools scott walker spreading the common core standards to private schools via the via the uh, voucher program so you don't really have a choice you have a choice whether your school is public or private but not a curriculum because it's still dicta dictated by the federal government through Scott Walker's program. And we seek to free people from that. There's the, the U.S. Department of Education has only existed since 1980. 1980. It's not one of those long-standing departments of the federal government. And education has steadily gotten worse in the last 38 years since it's existed by any measurable standard. So why we should, why we should be promoting the idea that, that the federal department of education should be dictating what the curriculum should be in anyone's school is ridiculous. And the right should go back to the parents to decide what sort of curriculum their children uh, should be learning from. All right, but just the local school districts do have the option to prepare their own standards under current state law, correct? No, I, I don't think so. And as a matter of fact, one of the scandals in the last DPI race was that the Evers administration, while they knew that, ki that kids could opt out and families could opt out of some of the Common Core testing, they weren't allowing their administrators to tell parents and to tell uh, people that that was possible. So people just assume that when the kid's given a test that they're required to take it and they don't have an option to opt out, opt out when they do. I mean, the, the overarching story here is that Scott Walker is a Republican, Tony Evers is a Democrat, and once elected, they're tied to their parties and to the federal government, to the, to the national level of their parties, and they do what they say. And regardless of what Tony Evers or Scott Walker might say regarding education or anything else, they're bound to their parties and that federal power from where the parties, you know, where the parties uh, originate from. And they're not going to do anything different other than promote these common core standards. You mentioned earlier about um, not opposing that, that you're opposing a general state income tax and just have it not tied to a specific purpose, but being a little more open to a gas tax or a property tax, if you will, if it's tied directly to some type of education or local benefit. So where do Wisconsin roads fit in this? And that's starting to heat up as an issue. We've had uh, Governor Walker uh, do away with the indexing of the tax, gas tax, and as a result, coupled with the more fuel efficient cars, gas tax revenue is way down and our roads are deteriorating. And instead of paying as we go, uh, it's been the choice of the current administration and the majority party to borrow for roads rather than pay as we go. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, waste, fraud, and abuse at the Wisconsin DOT. Um, we know historically that the road builders and, and road construction folks have given generously to both Democrats and Republicans to make sure that the DOT uh, continues to be a way that they, that they prosper. Um, recently, I think last week it came out, uh, a Milwaukee newspaper did a story on how the Wisconsin DOT is knowingly double paying for some parts of the road construction going on around Milwaukee, knowingly double paying. So you have a situation where the government knows it's paying for things twice and whatever contractor that is that is involved is accepting payments twice. Um, there's a lot of exploration that needs to go on within Wisconsin DOT. So that's one way that we can look that we can lower the costs of roads and have better roads. But understanding that's probably not enough. We need to help we need to help local uh, units of government make good, de good decisions about their roads and properly index who's using the roads to who's paying for them. So you're absolutely right that with more fuel efficient vehicles and electric vehicles, that those vehicles use the roads and don't pay the gas tax. So we need to look at things like tolling. And that's not a popular you know, position, 
uh, but it's the most tied to the actual use of the roads and it does apply to vehicles that are from out of state and if they're not buying their gas in wisconsin so be it but they should be helping paying for the roads so between those three things waste fraud and abuse wisconsin dot um you know looking at different ways of paying for it and getting local governments more involved in, in the taxation and the building of the roads i think we can solve the problem without uh without too much other stress or, or problems okay so this toll road you wouldn't uh uh, limit it to interstates where it is in many states. You would take it down to more local level, even county township roads. Well, I wouldn't want to have that much control over it. As I said, uh, you know, we're all about local control. So I think that the the genius of Wisconsin uh, is that when people meet together at the local level, school boards, uh, uh, transportation boards at a local level, county boards, whatever it might be, city councils that they can come up with solutions that work for them. And if it means there's a toll here and there, fine. They should be free to impose that. If they don't want to do it, if they've got another way to take care of the roads, so be it. And then when those, uh, if, if things get too expensive or too out of hand, then people, just like they do now with school districts, can vote with their feet and move somewhere else. And, and that will create an atmosphere somewhat of competition, but of a, a more of a collegial competition where there are 72 counties looking for solutions to problems and not just one state government that doesn't really need to listen to anyone else. All right, and I'm going to mention one other statewide institution. That's our uh, university and uh, vocational school system. So where do you stand on that? Would you uh, be in favor of eliminating it or um, continuing to freeze the tuition like uh, uh, Scott Walker's done? Well, I don't think tuition is the issue. I think that we need to be open to different kinds of education. As we see from other kinds of education, there's a tremendous opportunity for online education, for education to be more widely distributed. Um, I think we, could, we need to continue to support the university, but we can't be married ideologically to the idea of beautiful buildings on this campus that has very expensive real estate and all these other institutions that are expensive and not necessarily necessary to a person getting a good education. Let's just be, let's think outside of the box about it and really address the needs of the people that are paying for the university. And if that means tuition can come down, great. Um, I think it, I think in that model that certainly would and could. Um, but to just control tuition as a way to crack the whip over an institution, which you've been an adversary of for a long time, such as Scott Walker has, uh, th that's just a political move. That's not one that's grounded in common sense and what's best for the people of Wisconsin. Well, would you... Um advocate for this change to online learning like over a short period of time, longer period of time, or would it be a hundred percent online? What would you No, we'll just see what we'll just see what people want. You know, we need to to uh to speak clearly about what the university is like. And we have a lot of uh uh, rhetoric about what goes on at the university for students. I mean, there's a lot of binge drinking. There's a lot of things that go on without supervision. There's a lot of, um, of things that parents don't necessarily approve of, but they feel that in order for their kids to get ahead, that they need to go to the university and stay there to have this experience or whatever. I think what we need to do is just offer it, maybe strengthen our, our center schools a little bit, uh, our regional campuses, and, and to not emphasize this sort of paradigm of go to the four-year school, come here, study here, live here, whatever. Um, just to be able to think outside the box, I think, is enough. And, and having parent comment and, and comment from local units of government to help uh, inform our decisions about that. I don't necessarily have a timeline for, for that transition, but I think based on the, West, the, the way the rest of the market is and how many people are uh, attending school online now and that increases, that we need to be at the front of that trend and not, and not clawing our way back from it. Right, and I don't know, I don't have the statistics. I know that students already are doing online because as you, I've had students go through our state university system. Sure, they, sure. They, they, they were having at least one class a semester where they were online. It's just part of also maybe the market thing with there's gonna be limited resources that are gonna to have to push more in that direction. Exactly. I think that we can control the cost of the university system by just looking at them fairly to not have a political agenda, but look at what's the best way for education to be provided to our citizens. And if it's through funding the state university and everyone agrees to that, fine. Um, but we should look at any other way that kids want to get education and what's most effective for them. And uh, I, would you be more in favor of promoting the vocational schools where uh, they're not on a four year timeline, but they're getting to the market with their educations more quickly? 
If that's what people want, absolutely. As a matter of fact, you pointed out that my daughter attends the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm not being a hypocrite about that at all. But uh, my son, who's, who's graduating uh, next year from Verona, a very bright kid, he learns a lot on his own. And the things that he's interested in, he won't be well served by attending uh, a four-year university. So he's probably going to go to uh, Madison College, get a two-year trade, and then educate himself for the rest of his life without that tremendous burden of student debt which I'm happy about because he's making a very rational decision about what he wants to do in his life and his future. And so I think we need to support that. Very good. So we've touched on the roads and education and taxation. Is there any other issues that you would like to address before we conclude here? Absolutely. I think a huge issue and one that not only is about justice, but about the size of our state budget is criminal justice reform. We know right now, as we speak, that Wisconsin incarcerates at the second highest rate in the country. is particularly high for, for black Americans. Uh, uh, and, and we pay more for the Department of Corrections than we're currently supporting the university system, which is, another, which is just crazy. But uh, so my proposal for criminal justice reform starts with legalizing marijuana because we know that those nonviolent drug crimes are a lot of people are in jail for. And secondly... Um, getting rid of getting rid of mandatory minimum sentencing so that judges can do the right thing when confronted with a, a case that doesn't fit the normal the normal parameters. Uh, reinforcing jury nullification, which I don't know if your viewers know much about it, but it's a right in the Constitution that's currently blocked by a state Supreme Court procedure. Jury nullification allows for juries to find somebody not guilty of a crime, not because they didn't do it, but because the law itself is unjust. And juries, as the ultimate authority in a court case, if there's a jury trial, should be allowed to do that. Next, uh, when I'm elected, I will start pardoning people who are in jail for nonviolent drug offenses. Now, Governor Walker hasn't pardoned anybody. He never convened his committee. He hasn't talked to anybody about pardoning people. But we have a lot of people in jail that should be back with their families and back in their, in their workforce. And that, that would save a lot of money as well. We're taking people out of prison where we're paying for them to live and putting them back in the work workforce and back with their families that they can support. Uh, not only that, um, we need to work for expunging uh, those crimes off of their records so that they can come back into the workforce without that stigma of having been convicted of a nonviolent drug offense. Uh, and last of all, people should have the right to vote. The idea that people's rights to vote are taken away when they're incarcerated is ridiculous. If they've committed voter fraud or some sort of identity theft or something, that makes sense. But we have a, a huge prison population in Wisconsin that aren't allowed to vote on things that the rest of us are allowed to vote on. And that's a basic right that we have as members of, a, of, of this state and of a democracy. So that's a really important issue. Again, not only for the justice part of it, but think of this. Think if we stopped this, this drug war, particularly marijuana, and police didn't have to go into neighborhoods uh, trying to enforce these, these unfortunate uh, laws. Our policemen would be less in harm's way. We'd spend less money on incarceration. We'd sp spend less money and the public schools because we'd have intact families that were raising their kids better and there wouldn't be as many problems going into the public school system. There's a lot of money to be saved with this idea of, of, of our plan of criminal justice reform, uh, but also putting together families and putting families and, and breadwinners back to work. Okay. Finally, I'd like to know what's your option on or what you would do about health care. Do you see that as an individual right? I know libertarians want to protect individual rights. Where does uh, health care fit in? that scheme. Well, healthcare and education, you know, by definition aren't rights because they require something of somebody else. The basic rights that we have as as human beings are are laid out, not completely laid out, but are in the constitution and and are in the bill of rights, but a right to something that belongs to somebody else isn't really a right. That being said, we have a plan to improve healthcare and make it less expensive in Wisconsin, and that involves some deregulation and separating the idea of health insurance from healthcare. Those two things have gotten so confused over the years that people talk about one using the other term and vice versa. Think of, think of this. If you had to get your car fueled up and get its oil changes and, and got new tires and that had to all go through your car insurance, how much more expensive that would that be and what, what hassle would it be and what kind of service would you get? Right now, the free market operates in that and you have car insurance just for terrible things that go wrong. If we can return to the era where there's primary care doctors who are just collecting money uh, for basic services, they'd get a lot less expensive. Doctors would be able to operate more. More doctors would be profitable. Um, you can do subscription services. Like I belong to one called Our Lady of Hope Clinic here in Madison. I pay less than $100 a month, and I get all of my exams, all my visits, everything for that low price. Plus, I'm helping fund uh, for this clinic to help people that don't have the money to pay that subscription. 
if we promote that, plus the idea that nurse practitioners and others should be allowed to practice away from the hospital, which they certainly are educated enough to do, uh, then we can solve the problem of too expensive health care. We can put health insurance back where it belongs as something for emergencies and not something we have to deal with every single day. Uh, we can really go a long way to help improving the health of our citizens in Wisconsin, the access to health and the expense of that health as well. Excellent. Well, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for your time. And uh, I want to thank our viewers for watching another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I remind everyone to make sure that you watch these videos, uh, learn about the candidates, and make sure you get out there and vote.